So there's 17 different power classes taught this quarter, and yet everybody in this room and that room chose to take the one on education reform. Why? Because all of us, at some level, have an interest in sincerely making a difference in the educational system. The good news for us, though, we can actually do that in a way that generations before us couldn't. By virtue of the time in which we live, we actually have the chance to change math curricula, potentially to include them as an art, to reverse the effects of unequal distributions of wealth and to bring more vocational relevance to our schools. And this is because, in the past, in order to change education, you had to deal in a large, cumbersome bureaucracy that's only grown more cumbersome with age. But more recently, we've seen the birth of a new kind of evolution, a new kind of education. I'm speaking, of course, about online education. But not just any online education. That which provides something called MOOCs, which is a silly acronym for Massive Open Online Courses. So these are full-length courses on the web which are completely free to hundreds and thousands of students at a time. Today I'm going to talk about two specific MOOC providers, give you a brief overview of them, ask the question, and then assess the answer to that question. So first the overview. Coursera, founded by Andrew Ang and Daphne Kohlerstein here, was born out of Stanford. They offered a course, one that they were teaching online, it got an excellent reception, and by a year later they were founding this company which aims to partner with universities to bring their classes online to be offered for free to hundreds and thousands of students. In this short time, they've grown incredibly. They have 1.8 million enrolled students. When I was starting this research, they had like 1.5. They have already reached 196 different countries. They're partnered with 33 different universities all around the world. This is since this spring. This is since they launched this spring. That, that kind of growth is unprecedented. It's downright awe-inspiring. But we see it similarly from Udacity, founded by Sebastian Thrun, seen here, wearing the very silly Google Glass. Now, they were also born out of Stanford, also from a Stanford CS professor. They also launched this spring. They also received $22 million of funding. They do differ, though. Their aim is to completely disassociate themselves from traditional schools. We've read about how uh, we should you know, change the standards of teaching qualifications. Well, their introductory physics teacher is an MIT grad who doesn't have any teaching credentials, doesn't even have a master's, but just loves to teach physics and does it really well. So the incredible growth of both these companies and of MOOC providers in general leads me to my question. It's tempting to ask about the prospects. This is so new. This is so different. Can this really succeed? Can this really have a place in the educational community? But the research has been done. The question to ask isn't about the prospects. Because we know what the prospects are. These are here to stay. We know that distance learning is at least as effective as face-to-face -face learning, probably even more so. And we know that a hybrid of the two is definitively better than either. And when you're offering free stuff, which is of equal quality to massive numbers of people, you cannot ignore that competitive edge. So the question to ask is about the differences between these and traditional schools. So I can ask several different things. How does how does the fact that they're teaching hundreds of thousands of students influence what they teach? How does the fact that they're doing it from miles and miles away influence it? How does the fact that students are joining for free influence what they teach? And how does the fact that they have to try to meet, you know, students from all around the world, 196 different countries? But more interesting than any of those questions, I think, is the one of money. Because these are so young, we can't be sure of where they're heading yet, but we can look at the driving forces behind them. And where educational institutions receive their money and their resources profoundly influences what they teach. Public schools, for example, they're under higher pressure to perform well on standardized tests and to adhere to legislation with regard to them. Private schools, in turn, well, they're under a higher pressure to cater to the needs and the wills of the families of their students. But these guys are interested. They're not getting money from the government. They're not getting money from their students. So I looked into how are they getting that money. This is what I found. Coursera, they've laid out a lot of legal backing up for them to be able to you know, pursue different tactics, because they're not sure yet. They fall into roughly the two categories of students pay or a third party pay. Four in which the students do, four in which the third party does. The first is certification, in which students will pay a small fee at the end to have some sort of certificate to like, prove that they accomplished the class, essentially like a miniature degree. Another is proctor test 
where students would pay to take some sort of test to validate what they know, much in the same way that high school students take the college course to take the SAT. Yeah, there's also the possibility of tutoring for students who might need you know, a little extra help to get private attention to support their employees. And then there's the possibility that they, to some extent, contradict the notion of free online education, and offer most classes for free, but some with a surcharge. Those in which a third party pays include recruitment, where potential businesses who want, you know, more employees can ask uh, Coursera about how specific students are doing, have access to transcripts, things of the sort. There's the possibility that they use this technology that they've been building to make this learning platform massive as a license of software to companies who want to use it for internal training. There's the possibility that universities and companies who want to test potential applicants have Coursera tested for them. And then there's the possibility that they advertise just like any other website out there. Now this is quite a lot. Udacity, on the other hand, they've narrowed it down and they've already begun. They're going through the certification tactic and they're going through the recruitment tactic. What's more, as I look deeper into Coursera, from the inside, even though they've backed themselves up legally for these eight, they're only focusing in earnest on these two. So that means that these two, these two are worth looking at. These two are indicative of where the future of MOOC providers is, which gets me to my assessment. Certification is actually not all that interesting in terms of finding the differences between traditional schooling and online education. Because we already have this. When you pay for college tuition, part of what you're paying for is the degree. So instead, I'm going to focus on the recruitment. Because this, this is unprecedented. We haven't seen something like this in education before. And let me lay out exactly how this is working. Students online can opt into this program, so it's not like selling their information. Instead, students who might be looking for a job opt in, and then Coursera Udacity will share this information with certain partner businesses. And then if the businesses, you know, pursue that student, have an interview, hire them full time, they pay a surcharge for when they actually hire someone. For example, Udacity in their last round had 30,000 students, not 30, 3,000 students, excuse me, opt into this program and then 20 of them ended up getting hired. So for each of those 20, you'd have to get the search on. And there's clearly a reason to be pursuing this. This is the one that both of them seem to be approaching, and the recruitment market is rather large. So we can start looking at the implications behind it, some of the incentive structures set up, because it's simply too early to make any definitive conclusion. Because they're not running from their revenue money yet. They're running from venture capital funding. So we just have to look at the different incentives, and then, as, as this plays out, we can take a look at are any of these actually playing a role, and we know what to look out for. For one thing, this is certainly an incentive to provide more vocationally relevant classes, because if you're receiving money from the people who will be hiring, then they're going to be looking most closely at the classes which are directly relevant to what they're doing. For another, this might actually incentivize teachers to make harder classes. You see, traditionally, Teachers, you know, they have an incentive to maybe ease up the classes or at least inflate the grades a little bit because what they need is students to enroll, especially with elective classes. I know this was a problem in my high school where um, having to ease up the class was, you know, an uncomfortable thing for the teacher, but they needed the students. In this case, recruiters often look at the more difficult classes, the ones that distinguish the students who will do well in their business and the ones who won't. And this also incentivizes these universities to be very flexible to the market, and very flexible to the skills that are necessary out there today. One of Udacity's core tenets is that it wants to like line up people and their technological, technological abilities with exactly what's needed in the market in that moment, and be much more nimble than traditional schools. So this is big. Like, the growth that we've seen, and this is not just from Coursera or Udacity. There are literally hundreds of other sites like this, and this is becoming a huge influence. So if you guys actually want to make a difference, and I know you guys do, if you want to make a difference when it comes to education, this is how to do it. You find who are the key players in this new form of education, and you find what the incentive structures are for how they're going to change, and you jump right in there. Harry was talking earlier about how his proposal to change the mathematics curriculum involves incorporating some of the online technologies there, and that's exactly the way to go. And we have the opportunity to make a difference. We can do this in a way that our parents' generation simply could not. Thank you. It's about 9.30, so you know. Okay, so you're going to get a good range.